Hello, I'm Professor Liu. Welcome to our live stream. Today, I'm being joined by art prof teaching artist, Lauren Welch. And today we are gonna do a deep dive on Lauren's artistic progression throughout the years. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques and tutorials. Lauren, when did you know as a child that art was going to be in your future in some capacity? Well, Clara, I don't really think it was a matter of knowing. It was just already my life because my father is an artist, uh, was an art teacher before I was born. So there was always art in the house. My grandfather on my mom's side was also an artist, like whole life, also an art teacher. So this was pretty much surrounding me all the time. And while it wasn't necessarily overtly said a lot, it was, I felt like it was kind of assumed by my parents, by my family, that I would be going into art, that I would be an artist or in a creative field in some capacity. And I actually kind of rebelled against that for a period of my life. You know how kids, they never want to be what their parents are because that's boring. So I didn't want to be a teacher. I didn't want to be an artist. I went into, I was really good at math. So I went into this uh, engineering kind of phase of my life for high school and then ended up doing art and teaching anyway. So that's that's where where I'm at now. I just ended up being exactly like my parents and my grandparents. Now this is a picture of your grandfather. What type of artist was he? What did he make? He was a they called him a thing maker. He was he grew up in the Great Depression and was very affected by that event. So he collected everything almost to the level of a hoarder and he would turn these things into art pieces. And he was really inspired by what was going on at the time. He had the, like there was cubism going on, there was abstract expressionism going on. So his work followed this formalist collage mentality. This is a picture of his art house in Nebraska. They had the main house and then they had this little house to the side, which was a studio and art space. And it was unlocked and people could go in and sign the guest book and look at the artwork inside. And this was where I hung out when we went to the Midwest, it was the only good thing about going to the Midwest was being able to see my grandfather's art house. Everything else about that area is like, no bueno, not my favorite thing. And your dad is also a very active artist. Can you tell everybody what type of work he makes? Yeah, so my dad is a male artist, M-A-I-L, the postal artist, not like he makes pictures of stamps for the post office, but it's this group of artists that follows the Fluxus and Dada movements where they're doing this performative work of sending these absurdist play on word kind of projects through the mail to other people. And it's the act of sending that mail, sending those art objects to each other that is the art. And it's very social. And I was uh, raised into this mail art male artist family. It's international. There are people all around the world. I'd say our base is really the New York male artists and the male artists in Maine. But because of that, I have this, this extended family all around that has always kept tabs with my life. And I've been the person also in my family of the triplets in me, my brother and sisters in me. I've been the one that has been also assumed to take the role of the whole Miller archive that my dad has when he passes on. All that is my thing to continue. And your dad's practice really had a direct influence on you because I believe he was the one that taught you how to make a rubber stamp, right? And we yeah. have this tutorial. Yeah, so some of my fondest memories are from when I was a child like 
five, six years old, being in my dad's studio and him teaching me all these different art projects. He makes tons of rubber stamps as part of, it's a mail art type medium making rubber stamps. So I would have my little eraser and I could carve that. And then I, I, I made this, he found the stamp that I made when I was like five or six years old. I was really into the Titanic and it was a North Star line, little round stamp that I used a lot. I thought that was crazy. So really early on this, this affected me, these kinds of processes. And what were you like in high school? Were you the art kid like the rest of us or what were you doing back then? Yeah, I was always good at it, I guess, and was considered the art person. But I, in high school, I wasn't really in the art club or the art classes. I was kind of an honorary member because I did art, but it was, I was a band kid. I was, I play the flute, I play the trombone, I play the piccolo. So all my credits went towards that. They, they never let you take multiple art credits. You can only pick one arty thing to do. So band was my area, I guess, band and math. I was real geeky, I guess, but in a, in a good way. And then, but I did do this supplementary class with my local group, the Sharon Arts Center, which is an enormous part of my life, uh, throughout my life. And I did these things where I ended up being covered up in paint all the time, these events called Art Attack. And uh, another one was like my 18th birthday that I had there at the Sharon Arts. So really just like this huge part of my coming of age was through this art center. And you also had a lot of early influences from other artists. You've had many throughout your life, but I know Nick Bantock, who wrote the Griffin and Sabine books, was a big influence on you. So what what type of, how did, how did Bantock influence you as a young artist? I ran into Nick Bantock's books by mistake at my local bookstore. He is someone who, sits on this fine line between mail art and fine art, the uh, area that I ended up going into or picking officially fine art painting. So he, he follows a lot of that, that logic, that aesthetic, but he also wrote these books about this relationship that happens through the mail and each page you can pull out letters and postcards and images. It's very, very hands-on. It's super romantic. It's very mysterious and a little strange. And it hits all those mail art, tactile, really wonderful things that I love. So Nick Bantock represents this transition for me in my artwork where I was going from this more playful, one-off kind of sending letters to people to maybe more image aesthetic based work, I think. Yeah, I did cool. a lot of these postcards. And at some point you had this decision to go to art school. How did you arrive at that decision? My mom took my best friend and I to RISD when we were 16, I think. And it was really my friend that was interested in RISD. I wasn't interested in art school at the time at all. And I really complained about it. I'm like, oh, this is so dumb. And, <laughs> and my mom's like, this is the best art school in the world. Like you have to like going here. I'm like, oh, it's so dumb. But I think I ended up applying to it anyways, just to like cover my butt. Uh, apply to a few art schools. And also by the time I turned 17, 18, I was veering more in that direction of art. I was uh, realizing that it came more naturally to, to me and it was more fun for me than say doing a whole bunch of physics problems. So I applied to RISD. It was, I think one of two art schools I applied to, I got in and I begged and begged and begged my parents to let me go. And they said, yes, under the condition that I raise part of the money during a gap year for my first year. So I worked as a lifeguard for like 60 hours a week, every week for that year. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are not aware that you've done these camouflage pieces. Did this start in high school or were you doing this more in college? I was doing, so I was doing body paint as a more 
formative type of thing in high school. But then in college, I had a class with Mark Miloff and he brought in this guy, Roger Hamlin, who I just love. Roger Hamlin was a scientist that worked with cuttlefish. If you guys don't know what a cuttlefish is, it's the cutest little creature in the world. It's like, it's a cephalopod, so kind of like a squid, but it can change colors. It can camouflage itself into things. So I, I was already really into this idea of ornamentation, decoration, muchness that was really easily translatable into patterning, mixing and matching patterning and colors. And that's how I got into this world of camouflage. And I did this series here that you see during my, I think it was my sophomore year, I was applying to uh, do some uh, a transfer for, for Cooper Union. These were originally part of a Cooper Union home test, the transfer. Um, and Cooper Union rejected me, but these pieces ended up being like a huge turning point in my work and are still some of the pieces that people only know me for like this work and not any of my paintings afterwards, which is like kind of weird. But I worked with a, another, I was interested in optics. So I worked with another artist who had deuteranopia, which is green, weak, color blindness. And we created this camouflage that only worked if you were colorblind with this particular type of color blindness. So that's why you've got this red patterning against this green patterning here. And that's my face. I had this David Bowie hair at the time too. And at one point, Lauren and I met. This is our how we met story. Lauren actually proactively fought to get into my class. Tell them what you did to get into my class, Lauren. I, so you're not supposed to do this. At RISD, it's definitely not allowed. I found someone to switch sections with me because I really wanted Clara. I heard she was the best. My really best friend in college had Clara and was like, oh yeah, Clara's the best. And this was like, and Casey had um, Clara and Casey and I were friends. So I just knew that I wanted, I wanted Clara and I also wanted Gareth Jones. So I found the one person who had uh, one of the teachers as a repeat and you can't have a teacher repeated, I guess. So I was able to switch with her into the class and I'm so glad I did. The rest is and history. All these drawings you guys have just been looking at, these were all done in my class. So this is how we met. And actually you did spend a semester as my teaching assistant the following year. And we had so much fun that semester. <laughs> oh, it, was, it was so great. All I wanted to do, that's what made me be like, I want to be a teacher was TAing for your class. I was like, I could do this forever. This is so great. This is so easy. It's we have a question funny. from Valerie. They're saying you're a triplet. I'm a twin. Have you ever made art about being a triplet? Oh, Valerie, that's really cool. Um, I am not a triplet. My brother and sisters are triplets. I'm the older one, the odd one out. And But one of them is also an artist. My sibling, Storm, is an artist. Uh, they have not made artwork about being a triplet. They're very separate, want to stay separate from each other. But I did go to school with a set of identical twins that work together as part of their art practice. They always make work together. Lord, you want to tell them about your red year and what happened? Yeah. Yeah. So when I took a gap year between RISD and going to purchase, I and I was still really into this vision stuff, this color stuff, how does color affect both our, our social cues with each other, and then also how does color affect our individual self-identification and perception of things around us. So I did this red year where everything I bought or all my clothing was red, all of the art that I made for a certain period of time was red, all of the things in my room were red, everything was red. It was a little crazy and I probably won't do it again. But, and it ended up going on for like 18 months because once you have all these red things, you can't just get rid of them all. It just kind of keeps going. And my, my nickname was Red. Like seriously, everything was red. It was a really cool experiment. It really screwed up my 
uh, color hierarchy in terms of learning how to paint. Um, you, you end up like overcompensating for some colors or for some strengths of stuff. Red is very saturated. It's very aggressive. I interacted with people differently during this time, but it was extremely valuable. And one day I'll get to processing like all these images. I took pictures every day of my outfits when I was in the third year, which is what you're seeing on the screen now. We have a question from Valerie who's asking, will you ever make a dedicated stream to mail art? Lauren, maybe that's up to you to bother me yeah. about because the, the joke at Art Prof is that Lauren has figured out how to get me to do stuff, which is basically the strategy my kids employ, which is what Lauren bother me to death until I give up. <laughs> well, the thing is, Clara, is that I'm always right, too. I have never been I'm wrong not. in advising you. <laughs> not yet, anyways. That's Lauren is responsible for the Art Prof podcast. So those of you who are enjoying it, you got Lauren to thank. And thank you so much to 10,000 Crows for the super chat. We thank greatly you. appreciate it. Thank you, 10,000 Crows. And now, Lauren, you spent a year at RISD, and then you took a gap year, and then you eventually finished your undergrad degree at Purchase. And, and what was that transition like for you? It was horrible. I felt like I lost my way for a while, a little bit. A year is not really that long in the grand scheme of things, but I wasn't sure I was going to go back to school. I was actually out of school, I think for 18, for a whole year and a half anyway. And it was through a friend on DeviantArt that I heard about purchase and then, um, that their daughter went to purchase. This is someone in the in the mail art circle, actually, which is really funny, mail art coming in again. But they said purchase was a really great program, had a really great painting program, which is what I had majored in when I was at RISD. So I decided to give it a shot and started this whole new life in New York and Westchester learning painting at Purchase, which is a public school. It's like the opposite of RISD in a lot of ways. And I'm so glad I did it. It really changed my mentality about how schooling should work, about how artists operate in the world, about, I guess, like the ethics of art school and private school versus public school, and got me primed for working with you for Art Prof. And you've had a lot of influences, like Vuillard has become very important to you, as well as a host of other artists. Like, for example, we have William Morris here. They're pretty different. I mean, William Morris is more like a textile designer, whereas Vuillard is really like a painter. So where, where do they fit in terms of your artistic progression? Well, they're both, I, I learned about Vuillard first. I learned about all the French painters. And this is something I've learned in my master's degree as well, is that in my heart of hearts, I descend from the French post-impressionists and from a long line of French painting. I am about as French as you can get without actually being French. So as far as painting goes anyways. So they, the French post-impressionist painters, Lena B, were really into using decoration or, or patterning and lots of really path patterning to in interiors to condense these spaces to, they're, they're very beautiful pictures of domestic life, but they're also very anxious. They have, because of all this information going on in them, and then William Morris fits into all this and that he creates these beautiful, gorgeous patterns. They're very intricate. And, you know, I love textiles forever. I want to be a textile designer someday in my, you know, fifth art life or whatever. But he uses things like birds and flowers and different, like, like, things, botanicals in the world, and fits them into these patterns that I think do a great job of storytelling. They, I, I think the, the one on the right is uh, uh, something about like birds and the strawberries. And I think of like these birds that we have in the yard that thieve, that take all the strawberries before we can eat them at home. So they all speak to me on this more narrative level as well. Now, Lauren, when I think about you, you're like a hardcore acrylic painter. I mean, you you are 
so deep into that material. In fact, I feel like I developed an appreciation for acrylics since working with you because I never was that into them before. But then when I watched how much you love acrylic paint, it was just like really, really fun. But markers became hugely important to your practice. So how did you discover markers, even though you were painting so much? Yeah, I, I, well, I was having a really hard time painting. Painting did not come naturally to me, and I didn't actually start really seriously making paintings until my end of my junior year, senior year at Purchase. And part of that issue was this awkwardness. I'm really into this level of cleanliness and perfection that's hard to get with paint or hard to get with paint in an efficient way. And so I had a teacher my senior advisor said, why don't you try markers? They feel more like using a pen or a pencil. You can get that exactness, but they also have that feeling of using a paintbrush because they're not quite as perfect and you can get all these different nibs for them and you can experiment with color. And so I started doing that and then I started doing it a lot. It turned out to be a really effective medium for me because it's super clean. I can take it anywhere. And I can also plan for creating these larger images in a painterly way and translate that effect really seamlessly. Yeah, I mean, you told, again, like the acrylic painting, I never thought about markers as a legitimate drawing material because I just associated it with third grade and coloring yeah. things in. But the thing is watching you when we were shooting this marker drawing tutorial, the way you use it is very painterly. And the way you layer it, the fact that you use transparent colors and opaque colors and paint markers. And I don't know, this whole world of markers opened up. And I really think I would not have done those brush pen drawings if I hadn't seen you make these. Yeah, I mean, you use them like paint as well, or at least like ink. Your, your Tombow ones really feel like a watercolor almost. So you're clearly experiencing that bridge of techniques as well. Yeah, because I ripped you off. So <laughs> that's how it works. <laughs> so because <laughs> this is Lauren's stream, we have to talk about the cats, don't we? Yes, of course. <laughs> the cats. About the cats. Oh, well, I lived in a household that was petless. Well, not petless, we have fish, but catless for 25 years, 20, a lot of years. And Cats are my emotional support in my life. I love them. They're so, they're, they're so them. They're so individual. They all have their personalities. They all are soft and furry. They all have their boundaries too. They're really into this whole like consent thing. Like you don't pick up a cat that doesn't want to be picked up, right? So we got a cat. I finally made my parents get a cat when I when I was like 25 or some 26 maybe. So that's Tor that you're seeing in these images. And then shortly afterwards, we adopted another cat, Spicy. They're both Maine Coons. They're both huge, really hilarious, like very silly animals. And they're really good for drawing. So I ended up drawing a lot of cats and I use them for everything when I need subject matter. Well, that's why the cat drawing tutorial we did was your dream job. You were getting paid to draw cats. Yes, getting paid to <laughs> that draw That is definitely cats. something to show off about to your art school peers. Yeah. <laughs> we have a question here from Megan. Any marker brand suggestions or favorites? Yeah, currently I am using a lot of Posca pens and I'm using those because they are a acrylic markers, which means they have pigment paint in them. And what I've found is that pigment paint markers do not, are, are more light fast. They do not fade as much as the alcohol-based markers. So prior to that, I was really using a lot of Copic markers, which are wonderful and they blend so nice and really, you know, they're the pen of all pens. They end up paying for themselves if you use them all the time. If you don't use them all the time, don't buy them, buy a different brand. But uh, they just, you, you, they're only good if you want to make prints of something because they just cannot hold up to the light over time. Let's talk about Bonard because uh, we 
talk about Bonard once in a while when oh, you're God. on a stream, right? I bring up Bonard whenever I possibly can in any of these streams. He's it's like, like me and my... Kathy Kollowitz. You can't separate us. I know, I know. And you're like such a Kathy Kollowitz like artist too. Like your work clearly mirrors that. I feel the same way about me and Bonard. Like I'm ripping straight from Bonard all the time. And it's like, I'm not even looking at his images. I'm not even directly referencing his images. I just feel like we're such a, a pair, like so closely related that it just happens that way, you know? <laughs> Yeah. And he paints cats. I mean, that seals the deal for yeah. you, doesn't it, so, Lauren? <laughs> Bonar, so one of my favorite things to do, you guys, is if you're ever in a big museum in your nearest city or whatever, go look for the Bonards and then try to find the cat in each of his paintings because I swear he always hides a cat in his paintings. And that's the best thing about Bonard is he's really working with how you remember something what is a memory like? And so you don't notice everything in the first pass or the second pass or even the third pass. I mean, it's taken me 20 times to look at a piece before I find the cat, but there's always one in there or a dog. All right, so you finished your degree at Purchase College. What did you do after graduation? I spent four years working as a gallery person. I went into the gallery world and I, I, well, first I moved back to New Hampshire. That's the big thing. And I moved back to New Hampshire cause it's expensive to just go out on your own. And even though I was raised by parents that were really into the arts, I was also raised by parents who are really anti-debt. So I spent a lot of time living with my parents, paying off debt. And it was very unglamorous, but I did get to have this art job at the Sharon Arts, which is where I took classes when I was a young person. And so they're like, yeah, we'll take you in the gallery. You can be a gallery grunt. And I worked as a gallery grunt for a few years under a few different directors. And then they promoted me to a gallery manager. And that was really cool. This whole process, I got to learn about how, how the art world really works, because even though we're this art gallery in this small town, it's a very old art gallery that's got a lot of connections with other places. And so we were working with museums and galleries of all different sizes and shapes like across the country to get artwork into our shows. And it was it was wild. It was a lot of work. It's very strange to be on the other side of the fence. You and I are sort of unique in that we're both practicing artists, but we have been on the other side of the fence because I spent four years as a gallery director at Wellesley College. And wow, it's such an eye-opening experience. And I think you had a lot of curatorial opportunities. I mean, you had a lot of shows you organized and I, I just feel like it really enriched you as an artist, it seems. Yeah, so that was a huge thing. First of all, I wanna say thank you, Simple Triscoll for the super chat. It was amazing, thank you very much. But um, yeah, during that experience, I was extremely lucky and I recommend this to anybody who is thinking about like going back home or wanting to do more um, things with their local art scene is that the people knew me there already and they were very invested in my growth as an artist. And since the um, Sharon Arts Gallery was associated with this university, the New Hampshire Institute of Art, um, I had a lot of crossover with the people there in Manchester as well. And they were all really invested in my growth and making sure I was getting opportunities to do like gallery work, curatorial work, teaching opportunities. They got me my first undergrad teaching job. And I, was always super supported, even though the hours were like really, really long and gallery work can be like very, very unforgiving. So what does a gallery grunt do, Laura? This is being asked by Blue Will Spirit. So yes, the gallery grunt or gallerina is the other word that I've seen um, are very, so sometimes uh, disparaging or self-deprecating terms that uh, entry-level gallery people use to describe their position. And those are used because um, you are mostly spending your time behind the desk, either doing like data entry, greeting people that come in, 
installing shows, driving very long hours to go pick up artwork in some other state, um, packing artwork, coordinating with artists. Basically, since this is a small gallery, it was like I was doing when I was a gallery grunt, I was doing all of like the the la all the labor kind of stuff, just like none of the decision making stuff. We, when I became a gallery manager, then I got to do more stuff like, um, you know, planning what the next year is going to look like for the shows, collab, like picking out jurors, uh, sitting on those kinds of panels, um, working with the artists on a more, you know, hands-on aesthetic level, like what is the show going to look like, writing lots of materials. I do a lot more writing as a manager, um, getting into more politics stuff too. That's the one thing you're saved from a little bit when you're a grunt is you don't have to deal with the politics. I mean, it's a huge amount of work to work at a gallery. And it's what I like to call invisible work because yeah. you walk in the gallery, it looks so clean and nice. And you're like, oh, the artwork just flies on the wall. It's like, no, we measured it down to the last quarter of an inch and we tilted it just that much. It's a huge oh, amount of work, guys. It's like, it's not even just that. It, I, feel, I feel like it's very similar to say, watching a theater presentation, like watching, yeah, theater. Uh, you, you watch the show, people know their lines, the lighting is great, everything goes really smoothly and you're just enjoying yourself. And that's the way that the gallery system runs basically, but you have the same, you know, very clustered, scary stuff happening behind the scenes where a piece breaks or, you know, you're you're fixing up like walls at the last minute or so-and-so decided not to show or the artist like really needs this particular thing now or the store is closed. It's ridiculous. Yeah, Maria Kelson, this is totally accurate. The type of work you only notice when it's poorly done. Exactly. Yep, because when it's well done, you don't notice it. It's not there. And Lauren, I don't know if this happened to you, but every show I did, no matter how on top of it I was, there was always some weird thing that would oh, happen. Something. Everything Why? that could possibly go wrong always does. I've never had a seamless show. And there have been times, especially like actually the show that I'm most proud of, which happened to be partly like of my dad's work. I didn't plan that show. It was just I inherited it from the previous director. Um, that show, I spent like three day, like three overnights in the gallery before that show opened up. I seriously thought we weren't going to get it up in time. There was so much work. I felt like I was going to die. <laughs> I believe you. Ben is asking, were there ways your work as a curator has affected the way you approach your own art making practice? Oh, Ben Putnam! Ben was my art teacher in high school. Well, I had him for an independent study for like, I think it was like a quarter or like a semester, but Ben took me under his wing. And cool. like, like the, the team, the art team at Conval right now, Conval is my high school, is the best art team in the entire world. I'm so jealous of those kids. So it's really cool to see you on the stream, Mr. Putnam. Um, Yes, it absolutely changed the way that I my art practice works. I am much more conscientious, I guess, of the relationship that happens between uh, gallerists or curators and uh, artists. I try to make that I try to make my work as seamless as possible to be ready to be shown if that's like what's going to happen. But I also think a lot about space in a way that I never did before. So before I was either doing this performative kind of work, which was really about the body, or I was doing paintings, which is really about making an image that usually ends up on a wall. And now I'm thinking more about how the paintings exist in the world, like how it's not just, it's not just a wall object, it is part of a space. And the space is also part of the artwork. And when art pieces talk to each other, as they do in a really good show, that creates a whole new piece, a whole new conversation. So guiding someone through a space has become almost more part of my art practice now than like the actual little pieces themselves. Seven Angelic is asking, ever have an artist bail on you? Oh, artists are so flaky all the time. <laughs> We're the worst. <laughs> I mean, 
I, it goes both ways. You know, there have been times when I've had to bail on other, you know, projects too. Like it's, it's really crazy out there. I think like in a, um, in a gallery sense, if that's what you're talking about, um, no, not to, not like an all out bail on me, but there have been definitely times where I have had to work really hard to compensate for something that is like missing or lost or like the artist says like they can't do, like that happens. My favorite story, Lauren, is I was running a sculpture show and the sculptor called me up and said, this piece fell off, can you glue it on? I'm like, dude, I'm not touching your sculpture, okay? Like you come and do yeah. that yourself. So yeah. you do get these strange requests that you're like, I don't think I wanna do that. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely had to like glue pieces back on to each other or like something falls off the wall. Wait, oh my God. I feel like I can share this now because the gallery is not affected by this anymore. Do you know, I think his name is James Aponovich. No, I don't know. Okay. He's like a big deal painter, like in our particular region in like the Northeast. And he had a piece, but it was in like a really crappy frame and like in the middle of the show, like being open, it just like fell out of the frame like, flat onto the floor. Oh my God. Did it shatter? <laughs> no, it did. I mean, it wasn't under glass. It was on canvas, but the canvas just went <sighs> flat, like face down. And like, it was like, I was out of the room for a second. I was talking to someone else and people thought it was just like a part of the art, like the <laughs> performance. They thought it was supposed to be like that. So it just sat there. <laughs> I, I guess that was your your Banksy shredding moment in the gallery, right? Apparently, it was really <laughs> sad. Okay, now at some point, you decided to go back and get your MFA, which is where you're at now. How did you arrive at that decision? Because that, that's a pretty big change in your career. I think it was always something that was going to happen eventually it was it was pretty fraught actually i was really i i don't know when i got out of my bfa i was more sure about getting an mfa than i even am currently getting my mfa i am really glad to be here i'm glad to have this experience happening but my original intentions for getting an mfa were so that i could teach and now having seen some of the back end of all that and seeing the landscape, talking with you, I mean, seeing the, we all know what the experiences are, right? And that has changed my relationship with teaching a little bit. So I'm getting my MFA because I think that I, I really want to go back to school and learn a few things now, but career wise, it's a little bit more fuzzy than it was previously. So it was really important to me to choose a school that was both um, public, like a, a little bit, a little bit less, um, I'm going to say like snooty. I wanted it to be a part of the world. And I also wanted to pay uh, not that much or not have sky high loans when I got out. So I'm at Hunter, which is a really cool place and I love it and I feel like it serves all of my needs. Maria is saying, when working in a gallery, did you ever get ideas for your own work from how you were handling other artists' art, like themes or ideas for a series of pieces? Yeah, definitely. There are artists that came in that inspire me all the time and really, Actually, what it made me more want to do is do more curatorial type work. I had ideas for shows all the time. And even when thinking about my own work now, I'm thinking about more in a, I'm going to say like a curatorial kind of sense and a layout kind of sense. So now I'm not just making pieces that are one-offs or even pieces that are part of a series. I see them more as part of a room. And, and I really want to do a show about a room, about a house where all these objects, all these art pieces, paintings exist with other objects in a space and the person has to navigate the space as if they're navigating a kind of house or room. So it's really drawn my attention to spaces. I guess like in terms of um, styles, a little bit less so. We're getting people in there all the time. My head's really not in that same space of being like, oh, I want to steal this technique and steal this technique. But I have, it has given me some really valuable relationships with other artists that have definitely affected my work and having conversations with them all the time. So many artists 
um, uh, Joan Grubin actually is like this person I'm talking to all the time. We really hit it off when I helped her install a show a few years ago. So things like that have been super helpful. And Lauren, you've also done a lot of collaboration specifically with Eloise Sherrod, who is one of the teaching artists here at Art Prof. Can you talk about that? Because you guys have a really unique working relationship. Yes. Elo I knew Eloise before I knew Art Prof. And everybody since uh, we first went to RISD has always confused us and thought we were either twins or sisters or something like that. We don't even really look so much alike, but it's just, I guess, a, an energy maybe that we have. Eloise is my closest collaborative artistic partner. We've had several projects that we've done together. We've been to residencies together, gotten grants together. We operate in, this, in similar spheres. And right now we are working on a film together. It's a documentary. It's about um, my partner Sam and I and our relationship inside of this house, inside of this room. I told you I'm really into houses and rooms right now. And it is painted all of the stills for each of the scenes is painted by me and then it is rotoscoped or uh, composited into the actual live footage by Eloise and Eloise shoots all the footage so it's really time intensive it's very involved I think it's extremely beautiful like it makes me want to cry all the time it's really made these spaces feel extra magical to me and I would say, what, five years ago, you got this email <laughs> out yeah. of the blue. I think you just gotten back from Iceland and I described that I was doing something and I didn't know what it was gonna be, but I want you to be along for the ride and you're still around. Yeah. So what was that like when I sent you that email? What was your first reaction? I think I was in Iceland. I think I was on a bus when I got that email. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, this is exactly what I wanna do. Cause I was still like in that phase. I was still really sore about the whole ending of my relationship with RISD and how education is valued there. And so you were like, oh, I wanna create this free art education thing for anybody that wants it. And I was like, oh my God, so do I, sign me up. I wanna be a part of your team. And I was like 100% thought you were going to succeed from day one. I was like so thrilled that you invited me to be a part of it. See, the thing is, I remarkably did not always feel that way. I have had so many doubts about where we could possibly go, but you have always believed in this from yeah. day one, which is amazing to find somebody like that on your team. So I think I did a really good job. <laughs> I have never had a doubt in your idea ever. I like, I don't even, maybe that's crazy not to have any kind of doubt, but you're, it seems like perfect. It still seems perfect. I still think it's the best thing in the world. Like you deserve a thousand bajillion bajillion students at Artcraft. Thank you so much, Dreamy Lizard, for the super chat. We Thank really you. appreciate your support. As you guys know, all of our content is free and we rely entirely on donations. We're gonna take you guys behind the scenes and share with you a couple seconds of Lauren bloopers. Here we go. Oh <laughs> perfect as she seems in all of our streams. <laughs> no, never perfect. <laughs> and so Lauren, you really like Alex Rowe, who we did a stream on the other day, you have seen us through thick and thin. And I mean, I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that, boy, we have had our lows, mostly lows. <laughs> We've had a lot of highs, but it has not been an easy project because it was not clear where we were going or what to do. I mean, I think in some ways this is the toughest project I've ever worked on because we really did not know what we were doing pretty much all the time, wouldn't you say? Well, yeah, I mean, we think of it as this educational kind of school thing, 
but art prof really is a startup like you created a startup and startups you know the notorious world of startups most of them fail in year one and if not by year one by year five and we passed year one and we passed year five and we're still alive so clearly you're doing something right but it's all part of the process and even though there have been some real shakeups we never felt like oh it jeopardized the the mission of art prof or it never jeopardized the team i've always felt like we've had really solid relationship as a team which i'm extremely grateful for because i can't tell you how many toxic types of work relationships there are out there Thank you so much, Ray Mayo. Really appreciate the love, you guys. It's just amazing to have everybody's support. We have a question from Maria. They are asking, with your passion for spaces at the movement, who is your current favorite artist? Love to hear about people's favorites. Oh man, I don't even I don't even move that much as far as favorites. I'm still gonna say Bonard forever and ever and ever. <laughs> <laughs> because he still does that thing with spaces. It's all about space and compressing space. But I will say that I'm really into collections and how people show their collections and spaces. So things that I'm looking at when I did this project last semester for one of my classes that was called Spatial Strategies. So I'm even taking the classes on spaces. Um, I was looking at Wes Anderson's curatorial work. Did you know that he did some curator type stuff with- I'm Nick not surprised. I mean, he's somebody who oh. I could see being really into that. It's beautiful. It's like his films, like the color of the walls is like, is in conversation with the object that's in the little box and stuff like that. Really cool. And then the other person is Peggy Guggenheim. She made her house, like her collection and her life and her house they're all one thing. And that's how I feel like my life is too, is there's no separation of art from the rest of my life. It's not like, oh, I go to the studio and I do this thing and that's my work. It's like the art exists here and then it turns into another object and then it gets used as another object and it is, there's no special hierarchy of the art versus anything else. Here's a question from John Murph. What would you say your art style to be in painting? Oh man, I guess it's hard to say what styles are these days. I'm definitely a figurative painter. I don't fit into the pattern decoration movement that's really about like surface and aesthetic, which is not what I'm into. Um, I'm going to say that uh, I'm going to do a cop out and again say that I'm coming from this line of post impressionism painting from France from like, you know, the late 1800s, early like 1900s. That's really where I'm 100% working from, not into cubism, not into uh, new realism or symbolism or any of that stuff. And let's talk about this little trip <laughs> that we took as an art prof team to Guangzhou, China a few years ago, because not only did we shoot this tutorial, which you guys should all check out, it's really cool, but you also have developed a lot as a teacher and quite a bit of it was with Casey because you guys were co-teaching yeah. a class in Guangzhou. And I think to this day, this is your favorite blind contour you've ever done. It is, I love it. I think it's hilarious. And I think it's so derpy, just like Casey's face. It looks just like him. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually Casey. My drawing is more Casey than Casey is. <laughs> and it's been really fun because as you've grown as an artist, you've gained so many more experiences as a teacher. I mean, you taught at RISD pre-college, you were at New Hampshire Institute of Art. I mean, you had undergrad teaching experience before you had an MFA, which is pretty much unheard of. Most people really need that MFA to get going. And so how has that influenced you as an artist that you now have this role as a teacher, not just in brick and mortar classrooms, but here at Art Prof too. It's made me feel a lot more humble about my work. It, it's funny, when I was a student, I thought I knew everything. I would always get into trouble talking back to my teachers. I think I would talk back to you. Really? I still talk back to you. Oh, you totally do. You always give me my advice back to me. I know, well, you're always asking for it. Like, come on. Oh, it's my but. fault now? <laughs> But yeah, so I had that student side of it and then I got to experience the teacher side of it and it 
I'm really into this kind of non-hierarchical teaching where you're working in a group, like with the group, with the students, and you are learning how to communicate with each other and you're teaching each other things. Like a lot of the things that we've ended up using in art prof tutorials, I think of like the visual journaling one, for instance, I actually learned that how to do that from one of my students in one of the classes that I taught, like uh, Eileen Orff, who actually ended up being one of your uh, interns for a while. She's the one that showed me that and like all of her friends were doing that. So stuff like that happens all the time. And the, my students critique my artwork, just like I critique their artwork. It's really a two way street, which I'm really that's the reason I like teaching the most is I get a lot out of it. I'm still learning. It's actually very selfish in a way I feel like I'm like, hmm, I would really like to know how to do character design. Cat. We have to do a character design tutorial right now, you know? Exactly. That's what's so fun about it is I, I feel like one of the reasons we work well as a team is that we are so different from each other. Like it's not an accident that Lauren and I rarely agree on anything. Like every time we have these discussions, it's always like you and me having this fist fight, which is just yeah. hilarious. <laughs> I mean, just- laughing. Okay, guys, look at this picture. You see this? We need a caption here. So tell us in the chat, what is the caption behind this photo? Because uh, we have a good time on set together, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you always get me those strawberries like every time. These dry. We have our rituals. We always yeah. have to go and get Bailey's ice cream at the local ice cream shop. Although I guess we can't do that anymore because no. I'm in Utah. We'll yeah. have to find a Utah one. I guess so. For sure. So Lauren, any plans for post-graduation or are you just not going there yet? I, we're Right now we're still in the middle of pandemic. So we'll see how things play out. I still have two and a half years left of my MFA degree. I still want to do more curatorial type work, but I don't know if I would go into a traditional museum setting like I was originally thinking about. Again, I have a lot of issues maybe with um, how academia works. And I think anybody who is in academia really does. So I need to grapple with that while I'm in school, figure out what it is that really attracts me to academia and if that is healthy to maintain in the long term. Um, I really appreciate doing stuff like this with Art Prof, where we are working on a more mainstream kind of level. And so I guess I'm looking for things that are more like that and more education based in my future. We have some captions, guys. Blue Wolf Spirit says, didn't you say, Lauren, throwing my advice that I gave her 10 years ago back into my face. And we have this one from David. When you, a queen, come across another queen and start discussing how to best maximize your choice. <laughs> I just love Amazing. this. And apparently Moses is going to make a meme with a photo of me and more. You oh, guys, go no. ahead. Caption <laughs> contest. We're going to have to do it in the Art Prof Discord yeah, after the stream. And we have a question here from Nadia who is asking, how can I connect with you? I really need some guidance. I'm all over the place. Well, what you can do is you can comment on YouTube. You can also go to artprof.org click on contact and we have emails there and you can find us somehow on any of those social media platforms. Discord. Discord. You can also go to the Discord. Yeah. However, before you do that, you should check out Lauren on Instagram because she's got awesome kick-ass stuff as you guys have seen. Lauren also has a website that you guys can take a look at. And guys, you got to credit Lauren for this because you have no idea how long she harassed me you about were, getting an art prof podcast. You were so against it. And I don't know why. You're like, I don't want to do that. It's so much work. I don't want to do that. I was I'm not like, against it. I just didn't want to add another thing to my plate. But this is a good thing to your plate. <laughs> I told you the other day in Slack that you were allowed to say, I told you so. See, I appreciate I it. I know. <laughs> On some level. 
please join us in the Art Prof Discord. Lauren and I will be in the post live streams channel and we are expecting some captions, guys, because oh my God. you know that's a <laughs> yeah. good one. I should post the picture when we get into Discord. Do it. Subscribe to our channel and join the Art Prof family. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters. Thank you to everybody for all of your contributions to the stream, for all of your support. Everybody stay safe. We will see you next time. Bye-bye.